Hi, this tutorial will get you started on graph two assignment. Uh, so many of you did complete graph one without any problems and going through the graphs that were submitted thus far, they looked great. That said, a few of you did experience some challenges. Um, and as mentioned, and, and I sincerely apologize for this, I know it can be frustrating if you've never graphed before, but uh, as mentioned, occasionally you'll see these slight variations between um, different versions of Excel, uh, different versions of Excel across a Apple versus PC platform. So that said, I understand that there may be difficulties. I understand all of you are trying um, very hard to, to get these graphs to look good. So don't stress out if you cannot make the graph look exactly like mine. That said, I, I think it's worth continuing to try to work with graphing, particularly if you expect to be doing this at some point in the future, because you need to figure out the the little idiosyncrasies and workarounds. There's typically always a workaround to fix something um, in Excel. Now, and, and I mentioned this, that Excel is not the best graphing program. So when I create graphs for publication, I typically won't use Excel, I'll use something like Sigma Plot or some other graphing program. Uh, However, Excel is ubiquitous. If you, any organization, any school you walk into where they're collecting data and graphing those data, people are gonna be using Excel. So it is worth understanding how to graph if you find yourself working in those areas. Okay, so we are going to do a multi-element design graph. Um, and you, you, you kind of did a multi, not a multi-element, but you graphed two data paths in the last assignment. So this one will be a little bit different and it'll show you yet another technique to create the data paths in such a way that the, um, the data paths are not necessarily connected. And I'll make more sense of that as we go through the assignment. So, I will graph the first set of data, and for the assignment, you will graph the second set of data. So um, I'll describe the second set of data when we get there, but essentially there will be two graphs. One will be a functional analysis graph. The other one will be a treatment analysis graph, so where you're comparing two treatments according to a multi-element design. So I will graph the functional analysis graph with you. Now, when we do functional analysis graphs, typically we will do something like this, <clears throat> where we insert the condition labels going across the top cells. And I'm getting these right from the worksheet. Okay, so I'll point that out to you. Okay, so I am getting that information from here. Okay, so attention, demand, play, alone. Those are my four conditions in this functional analysis. And I, you know, I might format those, <clears throat> make them bold, and so forth. The next thing I'm going to do is put um, session numbers down the left-hand column. Okay, so my session numbers are going to be 1 through 20. So I'm going to use Excel to my advantage here. First type of one, then type of two. I'm going to highlight both of them. Come down here to the corner to where my cursor changes and left click and drag down to 20. <clears throat> so now I have um, 20 sessions listed. Now this part's gonna be a little bit tedious. There isn't a quick cut and paste way of doing it. One of the things you will notice is um, that I have my conditions running across the top. So I'm going to enter each of these data, data points, if you will, uh, according to the condition and the session number. And what ends up happening here is you get this sort of diagonal pattern Right, so session one is an attention condition. I'll just start typing them in. And it looks like the SIB per minute will be one. There are no calculations here. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, demand, there were six responses per minute. Play, there were zero responses per minute. And alone condition, there is one response per minute. Come all the way over again to the attention column. Um, and I see that there were, working here now, two responses per minute. In the demand, there were nine responses per minute. Play, one response, alone, zero. Come down to session nine here. For attention, one response per minute. Demand, five responses per minute, zero, and zero. And I'm gonna continue in this fashion. So now I'm on session 13, so right here. <clears throat> Two responses per minute, seven responses per minute, zero, one. And then we will finish up with two, 10, one, and one. <clears throat> okay, so now I have my functional analysis data in there uh, and I'm going to graph. So I'm going to highlight everything. Oh, I'm sorry, just the data. So the data, uh, the condition labels, as well as the data. And I'm gonna choose insert, come over to the line graph select it and then select the lines that are in you know, sort of crossing over line with markers and what you'll get is something that looks like this okay so here's where where the fun comes in and i i know all of you are probably frustrated with this so i'm just going to resize this window to make sure i have have enough room to do certain things like insert legends and labels and all that good stuff. <clears throat> so the first thing you notice is that the data points are not connected. So I am going to use my right mouse button to call up select data. I choose select data and you'll see here hidden and empty cells. So you, some of the cells are empty. We need to tell Excel what to do with those. We're not gonna show them as gaps. We are going to connect the data points with a line. And if we hit okay, your data points are now connected, right? Um, and you can see clearly that these data are differentiated. The next thing I need to do, even though it's showing, it looks like it's showing the correct session numbers, one, two, three, four, and so forth. Um, I am going to define those values. So once again, right click with my mouse, select data. I'm going to enter the information I need in the horizontal category. So if I select that, I'm going to start from session one and highlight down to session 20. Now, once again, I, I described this in one of the other video tutorials. I could sort of check this and, you know, I can't make sense of all of these, these words and symbols and so forth. But what I can determine is that um, it is defining for me that we are working from row three right up here, row three, all the way through row 22. Okay, so I could see that. More importantly, I could see that it matches up with what I have highlighted, at least for the attention, row three through row 22. It even tells me the column, right? So column A, right here, this one says column B. So these are sort of ways you could check if you are inclined to do so. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight that and you know, it doesn't look like anything changed, but certainly I know that these values are now aligned with my session numbers. And then I'm gonna go ahead and clean this graph up. So let's see, I'll start up here with chart elements. If you need to call that up, it may not be readily highlighted. I select the chart, 
I could double select and then it calls up chart elements. I'm not going to use the grid lines. So I'm going to take those out. I'm going to add axis titles, <clears throat> primary axis title will be session. Let me make this window a little bit larger. Okay, so I have session up here. And then primary vertical axis will be, I forget what I have, SIB per minute. SIB per minute. And once again, I'm getting that from my um, my Word document here, SIP permanent. Okay, that looks good. Um, I'm going to move the legend to the right. Okay, so now that looks good. All right, so things are looking pretty good thus far. I'm just going to do the rest of the formatting. I'm going to add the axes. So I'm going to highlight my <clears throat> y-axis. Select line, make it a solid line. I'm going to make it black. Maybe increase the width a little bit. Again, that is stylistic. Then I'm going to come over to the graph icon and um, enter my tick marks, <clears throat> major type on the outside. Okay, so now that axis is formatted. Here is, I'm going to move to my x-axis and do the same thing. So paint bucket icon, solid line, I'll return to black for me, 1.25, and then I'm going to add my tick marks. Okay, um, and I'm going to make the minor type out, outside. Here's where sometimes people run into problems. Um, that, that, so that seemed to work for me perfectly fine. My first data point is not falling on the y-axis, all that good stuff. Some things that could go wrong here, you know, depending upon your version of Excel, um, if you choose major type, that might throw things off a little bit. So major type inside, you could see that now that the tick marks are not exactly on the data point. In most cases, you know, if you're not publishing, that's probably okay. I don't think anybody's going to um, be nitpicky about that in a professional environment. But I always find that the minor tip tick marks works well there and that it always falls on it. However, what can happen is, let me see if I can make this. If the axis position, I believe, is on the tick marks right. So if you have that selected, then your um, data point moves to the y-axis and we don't want that. So <clears throat> you might have to select between tick marks. Let me call that back up again. Um, okay, so that's that. Another thing you might run into, and, and you, it's not going to happen here because we have session numbers, but I think one of you uh, had an, not really an issue per se, but um, sometimes the number will not be reflected correctly. This is just a number, so that's fine. But if you need to format it, it would be down here if you need to change it to a date or a time or so forth. So general is fine here. Another thing, if you have dates in here, which we, we would not, but I'm, I'm sort of giving you just another tip for Excel. Um, if these value numbers or if they were dates, if they happen to be cluttered, you could go to this icon here and uh, let me see if this is the correct one it is not let me highlight again there we go um, so if i have this axis highlighted and i use this icon which i'm not sure what it is size and properties i can actually change the direction of those numbers right so i could put them on a slight angle um, and this can be useful if that axis is cluttered with numbers, right? This one isn't, so I'm going to keep it at zero because I can use that, right? So that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is you don't have to show every number. You could show every two numbers and things of that nature. So yet again, another tip. Okay, so um, I guess the last thing I'm going to do is just put in functional and 
analysis. Ah, there's more things I have to do, I apologize. Um, so one of the things we do, even though these are color coded, uh, typically you'll notice that functional analysis graphs have these sort of unique um, data point markers. So I'm gonna show you how to enter those in. And we are gonna start with the demand condition. Now, I could tell it's a demand condition in a couple different ways. One, cause I could see that my data are quite high and these data are plotted high, but probably the best way to determine would be to select it. And I can see that it's highlighting the demand data. Often the data point for um, the demand condition is a triangle. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and enter that in. So once again, I select the data path. I wanna make sure that all or mostly all of these data points are highlighted and they are, right? I can see that's highlighted. This one is not for some reason, but these are. So if I come over to the paint bucket and I choose marker, marker options, now I can change to a different symbol. Okay, I choose built in. There aren't a lot of them, but we can sort of make modifications to you know, get more out of it. Um, now I'm gonna actually make the size, I think seven. Once again, just for clarity, I think it, <clears throat> it makes things uh, easier to read when the symbols and the font are a little larger. So those are pretty much done. Now, technically the, the data points are open triangles. So I'm gonna go ahead and make them open triangles. The way in which I do that is um, by formatting the, the marker. So the border will be orange, right? I can see it's automatic, it's showing orange. If I wanted to make it black, I can make it black. Um, but I want the fill not to be no fill, because if I do that, what happens is the, the line goes right through the marker. I actually want it to be a, a, oops, a solid fill. marker, solid fill, and I want it to be white. Okay, so now I have a nice marker. Okay, and I'm gonna do that for the rest of them. And, and you, you, you don't really have to know these symbols. Um, in fact, I might even make a mistake here. So let's see, the attention condition, I believe, are always squares. So once again, marker options built in square and I'll make it seven. And I think those are also open. Okay, the alone condition, I believe are open circles. I could be wrong. Okay, so seven solid fill. Okay, it's doing things for me automatically, which is great. And then the um, play condition is a solid circle. Marker options, built in, seven. So I'm gonna keep it as is, solid fill. Okay, so now my functional analysis graph is done. The task for you is going to be to graph these data. Now I'm gonna uh, get you started, okay? Um, so I'm gonna make a new sheet and I'm not gonna get too far into this, but we're gonna have sessions. Actually, I'll leave a little bit of space here just, just for the sake of leaving space. Uh, it'll be session numbers. And then we have a baseline condition an FCT condition and a DRC condition. So FCT, functional communication training, DRC, differential reinforcement of compliance. Uh, and these are being compared in multi-element design. Okay, so let me enter my session numbers. <clears throat> One through 20. 
Okay. So essentially, I'll make things somewhat easier here. You could simply cut and paste these. Nope. I need to get out of this. There we go. Okay, so I could cut and paste these values out. C and B. so that makes it easy enough. I you know, probably take these grid lines out. No borders. Now for the uh, FCT plus DRC, all you have to do is once again, see where we are, session six, the value is zero. Okay, then the next condition on session seven is DRC and the value is six. Okay, so you're gonna follow that format all the way down. <clears throat> now, what's gonna happen here is um, these data points, when you plot them, will not be connected. They, they, it's likely they will not be connected. So remember, what we're doing is going to select data, show empty cells, connect data points with line. Um, the other thing that will happen <clears throat> is actually, let, let's, let's just get you started a little bit further. Um, insert graph okay okay so uh, select data connect data points with lines um, well there, there I need more than two data points here so we'll put it in three and five. Okay, so now we see the lines there. So uh, the, the benefit of plotting things this way or, or entering your data this way is you don't have to worry about separating the data path uh, between conditions because you've done that technically in the way you format your spreadsheet. Okay, so the baseline is separated uh, and then the other two conditions are separated. So once again, this will be technically it'll be an AB, but a multi-element design. So you have a baseline, uh, you'll have a phase change line, and then this multi-element comparison of FCT and DRC. So um, take your time. Once again, if you're having serious issues with things, um, you could feel free to send me your spreadsheet, uh, but don't drive yourself crazy. I will take all of this into consideration and grade you know, lean, leniently, of course. Okay, I think that should be enough to get you started um, and uh, hopefully give you yet another way in which you could graph. All right, have a good week.